a children's sermon, and at that point I would ask those who are fifth grade and under, if they would like, they can come forward and take a seat at the front, and we'll have a short sermon for them as well. Let us begin with prayer. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray you so to open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that through the preaching of your word, we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe in Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please begin with hymn 438. Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, in poor 
sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. servants and of your people Israel. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Glory be to the Father. rich man who 
was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. For there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abram's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments and Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one of them goes from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Here ends our New Testament reading. <laughs> our faith together this morning in the words of the Nicene Creed. Please rise. <clears throat> I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, Begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdoms shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. And any children, grades, fifth grade, and under are welcome to come forward. And we'll form a little circle right here somewhere. thinking about it. What's your job? What do I mean by that? Are you a carpenter? No. Not a carpenter? Are you a policeman? No. Well, what kind of jobs do you think you all have? Hmm. I'm going to think about it. Are you students? Yeah, yeah you're students. You were having class down there earlier. You have class at school. What about 
being children of your parents. <coughs> yeah. You listen to mom and dad when they tell you to do things, or your grandparents, or your aunt and uncle when they tell you to do things. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Points for honesty, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, those are part of your jobs as kids. Now, this morning, there's going to be a word coming up in the sermon, and that word is contentment. You know what that means? <laughs> After you've eaten, you're so happy. That was the definition there. Yeah, you can think of contentment like that, like the big dog that just had a good meal and he's laying out in the sun, right? He's just happy as can be. That's what contentment is. It's happiness. It doesn't mean anything less than that. It's happiness. You're happy with what you have, exactly. So your jobs now are children and students. What do you want to be when you grow up? You know what you want to be? No? Well, whatever you decide that you want to be, I'm sure it'll be a job that makes you happy. And why do we have jobs? Is it yeah. so that they can earn money, so that they can live in a house? And houses cost money. And so your cars, and I'm sure your parents and everyone else out here will tell you that everything costs money. So yeah, we have these jobs to earn money. Well, there was one job that cost a whole bunch, and we couldn't do that job. And we couldn't afford the debt that we owed. Do you know what that was? Mm -hmm. Well, are we sinners? We are sinners. But does God see our sin anymore? No. He forgives us our sin. And why does he forgive us our sin? Because he died on the cross. So God sent his son into the world to take that job that we couldn't do. And he paid off our debt. So all of that is paid for. Great. You know what? It doesn't stop there because God has given you even more than that. Like, what do you guys like to do for fun? Jump on the trampoline. What's that? Yeah. Come on, Kim. We'll play games. Do you have other things that you like to do, like play with your friends and you're probably a good artist. You like to draw. Yeah. Like to write. Like to sing. Like to go to church. You know what? All of these are gifts from God in addition to what He's already given you. And if you have a whole bunch of something, are you supposed to keep it to yourself or do you want to share that with other people? Yeah, you want to share it. Good answer. Yeah, you want to share it with other people. Well, that's what we're going to learn about this morning that we have been given everything that we need and more. And because Jesus has done that for us, we get to share that with other people too. All right. You can go back to your seats. And we will continue with our next hymn.
is a shield to those who put their trust in him. This morning, that pure word of God, which we consider, comes from Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things, and pursue righteousness. Godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay a hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own name, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. He gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So far our text. In the name of our Lord and Savior, who is all and gives all that is good, your fellow redeemed. Contentment, that word has kind of been given a bad meaning these days. Think about that for a moment. What is contentment in the eyes of the world? <clears throat> contentment isn't happiness. Contentment is mediocrity, according to an ever-changing context of language. And yet that's not what the word means at all. It is not mediocrity. It is not Settling in the sense of giving up, and it certainly doesn't mean that you have nothing of value. No, contentment is happiness. It is happiness with what you already have. And going through the dictionary to look this up, I found this great definition from the Century Dictionary. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, but they gave much longer descriptions of words than what was really necessary. They compared contentment with satisfaction. And it said that contentment is passive, whereas satisfaction is active. Contentment is the feeling of one who does not needlessly pine after that which is beyond his reach, nor does he fret about the hardship of his condition. But needlessly pining and craving those things which are beyond our reach is a staple of the human condition. You can see how people might be tempted to paint this word contentment in a negative light. Our text this morning, though, says that contentment is a good thing. Now let us not forget the modifier there at the beginning of the text. Not just contentment, but rather Godliness with contentment is great gain. And I like, too, that passive definition that the dictionary gave to it, because this contentment that we have is not something that we actively earn on our own, but it is something that is given to us in a passive sense, as in God has given it to us. So yes, contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. But when we talk about this, we have to recognize that we are talking about Christian sanctification. 
So we've discussed this in the past too, how sanctification can only follow justification. Well, what does that mean? It means that you have been justified freely by Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit has worked faith in your hearts. It tells you about this Savior, and because you are justified, you are therefore declared not guilty of the many sins that you have committed. Sins that once condemned you to death and hell. That always comes first. Justification. But now you are sanctified too. God calls you to live a life befitting that glorious gospel message that he so freely shares with us and through the Spirit so that others may see and hear it as well. You have been set aside for this holy purpose by God, not to do works, but to do good works. And being content with what you have is an acknowledgement that what you have isn't yours, a good work. Everything that you have has been given to you by our gracious God. And that's why Paul implores Timothy here in the text not to put his trust in the creation, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. See, this is an important reminder of the Christian's life so that they do not fall into what he calls that temptation and snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for some, for which some are strayed from the faith and their greediness, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Now, when we think of that greediness, we might get this picture of Ebenezer Scrooge in our head who's counting his gold coins by the dim candlelight, who has nothing else going in his life except for the counting of his money. Or you might think of the slick businessman in his fancy suit and his sports car. You might think of greedy bankers or landlords who overcharge their renters. But when we think of people who are tempted by money and give in to them or give in to that temptation, who thinks of themselves? Not a lot of us, probably. But we might have this stereotype in our mind, we don't need to look any further than a mirror, though. Because there in the mirror, you're going to see an imperfect being who's been tempted by many things and has even given in to those temptations. You will see somebody looking back at you from the mirror who has taken a look at the bank account and absolutely freaked out because the number in it is either way too low or it could be higher. You'll find somebody staring back in the mirror who has put their faith and trust in something other than the God who provides daily for them. You will find a wretched sinner who had absolutely nothing at all, nothing in this world, and nothing with which they can take out of it when they leave it. Yeah, you will see somebody who has been tempted and these thoughts of money and not just money but other earthly materials are temptations the devil he's constantly working trying to get you to put your faith hope love and trust in something temporary as opposed to the immortal and living god and notice that paul even says here that money's not the sin here you can have money Money is a gift from God. But it's that wanting more, that not being content, that opens the floodgates of sinfulness. And it's not just that. You can have no money at all. Many religions even encourage the forsaking of money and material items so that you can be closer to God, or if not be God, a God, and if not God, then to be in harmony with nature or something of that sort. But guess what? That doesn't help. It doesn't help as a work. It doesn't save. Happiness has to come from somewhere. And if it doesn't come from the things that we have or those around us, where does this happiness come from? Are we told that it comes from God? 
the contents of grace provide for contented living. Because that's what grace is. It is an undeserved gift, and it is one that is given without condition. Now, when I was studying that word contentment, I came across an even older meaning for it. One that isn't used any longer, but it is definitely worth mentioning. Because it was from an old French one around the 1400s, and even by the 1590s, it was already phasing out of meaning. But the old word contentment is one that means a satisfactory payment for a debt. Wow, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? That is exactly what we are told of, of Jesus Christ, who has given himself, who has told us of himself through the word. Yeah, contentment is being happy with what we have because God has freely given it to us. Grace is that gift of salvation from God through Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He came to the earth to make a satisfactory payment for that debt of sin that we could not pay. Because he justified you by his own sacrifice. You are his own. You are free from the shackles of sin. Whereas you once looked in the mirror and you saw this wretched sinner staring back at you, now you look in the mirror dimly. And you see him. But then face to face. But the same grace that saved you, now flee the evil things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. Fight the good fight of faith, not just on the spiritual battlefield, but in every corner and crevice of your life. Use those things which God has freely given to you to glorify him in all that you do. You can be cautious, but not fearful in your work. When you give, give freely as the Lord has freely given to you. Sure, you can be cautious in where you put your time, money, and talents so as not to cause others to stumble. But never be fearful of wasting your time, money, or talent in the service of God's kingdom. Yeah, you can be cautious of your finances to make sure that you can take care of your families. But you need not be fearful that the Lord will not provide. You need not be fearful that time spent for him is squandered, that use of your talent in his name would be a fruitless affair, because it is not. You are called to share what he has given you with others. There would be spiritual atrophy if these things were not used. Now, atrophy is made well known as when the muscles in the body grow weaker, decrease, when they shrivel up, they become worthless. The gifts of God, they don't become worthless. They don't shrivel up and die. But they can be wasted. Faith can go into atrophy. It can move in the right direction. It can move in the wrong direction. But faith cannot stand idle. It grows by the grace of God or it shrivels up from the misuse of it. Use these gifts. Be content with all that you have, physically and spiritually. And do not misunderstand that contentment to be something that it's not, because it is not mediocrity or settling because you've hit rock bottom and that's the only thing that you can have. It couldn't be farther from the truth. You have been purchased with a price, and your work is according to that. And you have been purchased with the most priceless commodity of all, the very blood of our Lord and Savior. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son into it to save you and by that holy, precious, innocent, and priceless blood that he shed, the debt of your sin was paid off in full. But he didn't stop there either. He assured you of your salvation through him. He assures you 
of your resurrection on the final day. And he also assures you that he cares for you until that final day. Your cup, like the psalmist, is not just full, it's overfilled, it's overflowing. The psalmist writes elsewhere, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all of your iniquities? Who heals your diseases? Who redeems your life from destruction? Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? Contents of grace provide for contented living because every need that you ever had, any need you ever can have, has been met and fulfilled by Him. Even when Paul was pleading with the Lord concerning the thorn in his flesh, the Lord said, This, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So not only does the Lord provide during those great and fulfilling moments of our lives, but even when we are at our lowest and when we are in pain and suffering, the Lord still provides for you. We may be weak, but he is strong. So you don't need to needlessly pine after what is beyond your reach, nor fret at the hardship of your condition, because God has met each and every one of your needs. The life of Jesus shows you his commitment to your reconciliation with God. The cross shows you his bloody but final sacrifice <clears throat> and the severity of God's punishment. But that empty tomb shows you that that punishment has passed over you and you are empty of those sins. You are his. What is his is yours and what is yours is now to share with others. It is within reach, not something to needlessly pine after. Therefore, do good, that you be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for yourselves a good foundation, one that is built solely on Christ for the time to come, that you may lay hold on eternal life. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Please rise in prayer. Divine Spirit, teach us the life.
life of loving service, we ought to live to God out of gratitude for his love, which Christ sacrificed for our sin. Through the death of his Son, he has made us his very own. Help us, therefore, to be dedicated wholly to him, freeing our energies, our abilities, our time and possessions, yes, what we are and what we have, from a life of serving self to a life of serving God. Do this, dear sanctifier, by filling us with the love of Christ. O Lord, you have made us your stewards in a special way, entrusting us with your holy word. Teach us that this word, meant for our own continual use, is also ours to share with others, that they may learn of the Savior's love for them and believing be saved. Help us and guide us so that we may determine how best to serve you as stewards of your word. Help us to determine what portion of our time we will give in personal witness to the gospel of Christ. Help us determine what portion of our time, energies, and talents we will use for God's work in the congregation and its various programs. Help us determine what portion of our earthly possessions we will use to support the, the ministry of the divine word, both in the congregation and the synod. Give to parents the ability to train their children in Christian stewardship so that even from tender youth they will acquire devotion to every Christian work and learn early in life to share the responsibility for preaching the gospel. O Holy Spirit, bless the offerings of time, talent, and treasure that we make to God for his kingdom. Let them be for each of us a delightful privilege and self-evident fruit of our personal faith. Since only offerings given out of love for Christ are acceptable to heaven, increase our love by diligent use of Christ's word and frequent attendance of the Lord's Supper. Forgive all those times when we have failed to be good stewards. Inspire in us to dedicate to, the, to God's use all that we are and all that we have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We sing our next hymn, number 439. <clears throat>
page 24. Please rise. The Lord be with you. <laughs> Thank you. 
and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you for the remission of all your sins. <coughs> may this true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior strengthen and preserve you in the true faith and the life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death, the remission of all your sins. Take Mary, this is true blood. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Savior, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith and the life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
Please rest. And we continue with the singing of the new Judas. <laughs>
once again. Our quarterly voters meeting will take place after the service. In between then and now is a potluck, which isn't a potluck, but it's a potluck. <laughs> Uh, that will take place either upstairs or downstairs, so be on the lookout for that. Even if you're not staying for the quarterly meeting, please stay for that so that you can use all of that up. And even if you didn't bring food, please. And even if you welcome. didn't bring food, yeah, yeah please. Because it wasn't really an official podcast, yeah. so you're, yeah. not, you're not neglectful. Yeah. It was a last minute thing, so don't feel obligated by that. <laughs> Uh, Singh met for their last meeting uh, in October, this last Monday. Uh, your new officers are listed there on the back of the bulletin. Uh, the next meeting will be whenever they decide to the group text, uh, sometime next month. Uh, a few announcements also here on the back. Uh, it's been asked and suggested that we do a choir piece, an adult choir piece for this, uh, for Christmas. So if you're interested in doing that or taking part in that, uh, even if you're not a good singer but like to sing, you know, all people are welcome to do that. So get in touch with me or maybe Melissa or some of the other ladies and let us know. Uh, the fellowship gathering or the fall gathering, that's going to be 630, uh, around 6 o'clock on the 21st, that's a Friday. And then on October 30th, uh, possibly going to have a Reformation potluck with a German team. Uh, then the joint area Reformation service will be in Jamestown that night uh, at 6 p.m. and study club the next day, so I will go to that one at least. I don't know about the service yet. Uh, also, the mission helper there at the very bottom of the page, uh, applications for that are being filled up to go to Nepal. Space is limited, so if you're interested, uh, hop on that right away. And then if you're wondering why your bulletin is so heavy this morning, it's because the coordinating council met two weeks ago and issued a lot of really helpful material so that you can see how your offerings are being spent Senate-wide, but also what all is going on throughout the Senate. So if you go through these pages, uh, you will see the various going-ons. And the second handout there, I printed wrong, so page one is on the very back, but I wrote down page one, page two. Are there any other announcements for any birthdays this week? Lord be with you. <laughs>